So we now know that we can propagate our orbits using the orbital elements A, E, and E, or nu. But remember, the orbit is fully defined by a single simultaneous measurement of the orbital radius and the orbital velocity vector, as long as mu is known. So we should be able to also, knowing r, v, and mu, go from r at a time t and v at a time t directly to r at a time t plus delta t and v at a time t plus delta t. So we will posit that r of t plus delta t is given by some function f, which is a function of t and delta t and whatever else we need, times the current orbital radius vector plus some function g times the current velocity vector. And similarly, that the velocity at a time delta t later is given by the scalar derivative of that same f times the current position vector plus the scalar derivative of g times that same velocity vector. Without having a specific form for any of these, we can already find one basic result that these are not independent quantities. The easiest way to see where this comes from is to remember that angular momentum is fully conserved. And so since the angular momentum or a specific angular momentum is a constant for all time, it's going to be equal to r of t cross v of t. And it's also going to be equal to the exact same cross product at the time delta t later. We can now plug in our new f and g function expressions into these two terms so that r of t plus delta t is f r plus g v. And here we're going to briefly drop the variable. So it should be understood that anything without parentheses refers to the r and the v at the initial time t. Similarly, v at t plus delta t is f dot r plus g dot v. If we carry out the cross products, all terms of r cross r and v cross v automatically go to zero. And so the only thing that is left will be, that is r cross v is equal to f g dot times r cross v plus g f dot times v cross r. And by the anti-commutative nature of the cross product, this term is the same as negative r cross v. If we divide through by r cross v, we get the relationship f g dot minus g f dot is equal to one. To get the actual forms of f, g, f dot, and g dot, we can plug in our component representations of r and v, and we can use either the true anomaly representation in the parafocal frame or the eccentric anomaly component representation in the parafocal frame. And when we do the algebra, these are the relationships that we get. And so here, just to make it this a little bit notationally simpler, we're defining R0 as the magnitude of the orbital radius vector at the initial time. So R0 is, at, is R of t, and R is the orbital radius vector magnitude at the final time. So R is R of t plus delta t. And when you crunch through all of the algebra, you find these relatively simple expressions in, as functions of the initial orbital radius, the final orbital radius, and the change in true anomaly, or equivalently, the change in eccentric anomaly. And this is great because now we have a fully linear system that directly propagates the orbital radius and orbital velocity vectors. In fact, we can even package this up in matrix form and write, that is, the vector of the orbital radius and orbital velocity at time t plus delta t is given by a matrix composed of f, g, f dot, g dot times the same position velocity vector at the time t. However, note that this matrix is specific for the initial and final times. And so for every specific propagation, you have to reevaluate this matrix if you're going to get an exact solution. This is known as the state transition matrix or the Kepler state transition matrix. And again, seemingly, this is very cool, but we can't get away from the transcendental nature of Kepler's time equation. We have hidden away the fact that we have to invert something numerically, but it's in there. And you can see that 
because you need to know the final orbital radius and the change in true anomaly or equivalently the change in eccentric anomaly in order to calculate these f and g functions. So at the end of the day, what is it that we've gained? We still apparently have to go through all of the numerical machinery. So this is a nice way of packaging things, but we haven't necessarily made any real progress. The value added here is that we now have a consistent system for propagating radius and velocity vectors, and also we can use this framework for exploring other iterative techniques for getting at this matrix. So what we're going to look at now is a power series solution of the orbital radius and velocity in terms of their initial values. And these are known as series solutions to the f and g functions. We are going to define a variable sigma as the gravitational parameter divided by r cubed. And remember, r here represents the orbital radius magnitude at the final time, at t plus delta t. And we're going to define a quantity p, not to be mistaken for the focal parameter, as r dotted into v, again at the final time, divided by r squared, which is exactly the same as r dot over r. The easiest way to see this is just to plug in the component forms of these two vectors. So let's very quickly verify this. I'm using the shorthand here where c sub nu is defined as cosine of nu and s sub nu is defined as sine of nu. And so we've just plugged in the component forms that we've previously derived for the position and velocity vectors. And when you carry out this dot product, what you get is these two terms cancel, cosine nu squared plus sine nu squared is one. And so at the end of the day, all you're left with is r, r dot. And once again, it's incredibly important to remember that scalar r dot is not the same thing as the magnitude of v. This is the scalar derivative of the magnitude of r, which is different from the magnitude of the vector derivative of r. So we've defined our sigma, we've defined our p, and we've simplified it. And next we define q, which is given by the norm squared of the velocity vector divided by the norm squared of the radius vector minus sigma. If we differentiate each of these quantities, we find that sigma dot, the time derivative of sigma, is equal to negative three sigma p. The time derivative of p is given by q minus two p squared. And the time derivative of q is equal to negative p times the quantity two p plus sigma. Again, let's make sure that this all holds. From this previous derivation, we can write that r dot is equal to r dot v divided by r. And that means that r double dot, which is just a time derivative of r dot, will be that is the derivative of quantity r dotted into v divided by scalar r is going to be v dotted into v over that scalar r minus r dot into v over r squared r dot plus r divided by r so the unit direction of the r vector dotted into the time derivative of v okay well this term is r dot over r based on this previous derivation this is the acceleration which is given by newton's law of gravity as negative mu over r cubed times vector r. And so we can rewrite this whole expression as r double dot over r is equal to v squared over r squared minus mu over r cubed, which we have previously defined as sigma, and minus r dot squared over r squared, which we have previously defined as p squared. And therefore, the derivative of p is equal to and this is the quantity that we have defined as q. Now, if we differentiate q, we will have that's 2v dotted into the inertial derivative of v over r squared minus 2r dot v squared over r cubed minus sigma dot. 
this term becomes 2 over r squared v dotted into a negative mu over r cubed r, again, by Newton's law of gravity. And the sigma dot is, and so this expression can be rewritten as, that's r dot over r times quantity negative 2 mu over r cubed minus 2v squared over r cubed plus 3 sigma. This is p. And this entire thing is negative 2q minus sigma. So we've, we've just done a ton of algebra. We've verified these things. How does any of this help anything? The key realization here is that every order of derivative of r has to lie in the orbital plane, has to lie in the parafocal frame. The position and the velocity and all of the motion of the orbit for all time lie in the parafocal plane. And that means that no matter how many times you differentiate any of this, you still get a vector that lies in that same plane. And so just as we made the argument that we could write the propagation of the orbital radius and orbital velocity vectors as linear combinations of the orbital radius and orbital velocity at the initial time, so too can we write any order of derivative of r as some f sub n times r plus some g sub n times v. And that means that if I differentiate this one more time, and so the nth plus one derivative of r, I will just get the product rule applied to this right-hand side, which looks like f dot n r plus f n v plus g dot n v minus g dot n sigma r. Let's verify this. So if the nth order derivative of r was f sub n r plus g sub n v, applying the product rule, we get that the nth plus one order derivative is f dot sub n r plus f sub n v plus g dot sub n v plus g sub n times the inertial derivative of v. And this, by our previous definitions, is equivalent to negative sigma r. And so if we package this together, we get which is the result shown here. So a very cool thing has happened here because we can now define this as the next iterant of Fn, call this Fn plus one. And similarly, we can define this as the next iterant of G, call it Gn plus one, which means that if we are able to start off with an initial value for F and G, we can propagate the series solution via these very, very simple iterants, as shown here. So f of n plus 1 is f dot n minus sigma gn, and g of n plus 1 is fn plus g dot n. How do you initialize this? Well, we just say that the zeroth order derivative of r is r itself, which means that f naught is 1, and g naught is 0. And so from this, we can calculate this series expansion to any order using these summation relationships. This means that we can now recursively generate a power series solution to the Kepler state transition matrix to any arbitrary order. And at this point, it is completely and utterly not worth our time to do this by hand. Instead, let's use our computational resources because this is something that computers do exceptionally well. So here's some code written in Python using the SymPy package, which is a symbolic math package for Python. And so what this is doing is encoding these relationships here. We have a function that's going to generate the terms of our series to order capital N. We initialize Fn to 1 and Gn to 0. The reason why this is done in a specific fashion is so that these are treated as symbolic quantities rather than uh, integer quantities. And then we will define a list of coefficients, fs and gs, like so. And we're going to just expand the list as we go along. This is not a particularly efficient way to do this because we are constantly expanding this list, but we're not really looking for maximal efficiency here because the actual symbolic manipulations are going to be taking a lot more processing power than just the bookkeeping. And so we're going to iterate up through capital N and for each iteration, 
we are going to differentiate f sub n with respect to time and subtract s times g sub n. s here is representing sigma, like so. And then we are going to calculate g sub n plus 1 as f sub n plus the total derivative of g sub n with respect to time. We are then going to set our current iterants to the plus 1. We are going to simplify them, substituting the various relationships between sigma dot and p dot and q dot that we previously derived. And then we're going to add our new iterant to the list, and we're going to continue. So let's see how this operates. We're going to generate an eighth order series. It'll take a few seconds. Now it's done. Let's print out the Fs. And here they go. And so you see that this gets progressively more and more horrifyingly complicated, as it must, as all series solutions do. But we're not doing any of this work. And because we're not doing any of this manually, as long as the code is good, this is guaranteed to be correct. Same thing for G. So these are just the coefficients of the series. In order to build the series, we need uh, a time variable. So we'll define delta t. And here is our eighth order series in f. And here is our eighth order series in g. And similarly, we can do the same thing for f dot because we have the f dot relationship as follows and the g dot relationship, which are also, you will note, only functions of f sub n and g sub n. And so just by computing the coefficients of the f and the g series, we get the f dot and the g dot series effectively for free, like so. This is cool and everything, but not ultimately super useful because you're not going to transcribe these things. You're going to want to use these things. But as soon as you have these in a symbolic form, you can automatically substitute values into them and just have the computer crunch the numerical values. And you don't even have to do this in the original language. One of the cool things about SymPy is that it can output code in a variety of different languages. So just as an example, let's say you wanted to use this in MATLAB. We can use SymPy's code gen utility. And there's many, many smart utilities, regardless of what language you happen to be operating in. We will replace our beautiful D delta t with just the boring dt. And then we will print out our code in Octave, which is the open source version of MATLAB. But it's fully compatible with MATLAB. And there you go. Here's our f series function. And here's our g series function. And here's our f dot series function. And here's our g dot series function. And I can output this to a file or copy and paste it into a MATLAB script. And it is guaranteed to just work. Or alternatively, I can take the pretty version and make a slide of it and show you that f to eighth order is approximated as follows, and g to eighth order is approximated as follows. And you can do this for any arbitrary order, although, of course, the symbolic manipulations get more and more cumbersome as you go up in order. 